Um, welcome to this Science Sunday speaker series. I'm Wendy Panera. I'm a professor in the School of Earth Sciences here at Ohio State. And I'm part of the Science Sundays uh, planning committee. Science Sundays is a free lecture series uh, open to the public that provides a wide range of current and emerging topics in issues in science that touch our everyday lives. Speakers are experts in their fields from on campus and from around the world with experience in making their topics interesting and accessible for audiences of all ages with or without a science background. Today is my great pleasure to introduce you to Professor Karen Lloyd, who joins us today from the University of Tennessee. She's an expert on fascinating life that occurs deep in the Earth's crust, in volcanic systems, and in the bottom of the ocean. Dr. Lloyd did her graduate work at UNC Chapel Hill and did, went on to do postgraduate work in Denmark, after which she joined the faculty at the University of Tennessee. After her talk, there, we have a tradition of continuing the conversation and questioning upstairs uh, for our reception. Please join us. Um, to, and, and, um, <coughs> And at, at, so after the talk, we'll have we'll take some questions in here, and then with further questions, we can take it upstairs for the reception. With that, please welcome Professor Karen Lloyd. Okay, awesome. So I'm going to talk about slow, energy efficient, and mysterious life uh, deep within Earth's crust, as much as we know about it right now, which is not all that much yet. Um, and I'm at the University of Tennessee, and I just put up this background picture. I don't know if it's um, with the lights, you can see it. Um, this is a picture from the um, volcanic arc in the high Andes of Argentina. And um, I am not, most of this talk is not gonna be about volcanoes, but I will come back to that. And hopefully you'll see how volcanoes fit in to this oceanic stuff that I'm gonna talk about. <laughs> Everybody know what planet this is? Yes, it's so fun to take Google Earth and flip it around backwards. Look at the Pacific Ocean. I mean, it's hard to get New Zealand out of the picture. It always creeps in there. But um, it's, it really, you know, we spend so much, I spend a lot of time looking at the globe from a continental point of view. Um, it's a nice little reminder to go online and, and remind yourself that yes, that 74% water statistic that you hear about for Earth is actually true. We are a blue planet. Underlying all this water are a lot of microbes. We know about the microbes in the water for sure, but underneath all of these oceans is a bunch of mud, which may seem very uninteresting and boring, but if you count up the total number of microbial cells in all the mud underneath all the world's oceans, you get an estimate of about three times 10 to the 29 uh, living microbial cells. Um, this is a third of the total number of microbes on the planet are in this boring, mucky stuff. Um, and this is actually about 10,000 times more than the estimate, the highest estimate for the number of stars in the universe. Um, so this is a lot of uh, microbes. So um, when we think about life on Earth, I, I, when I do, I think about the life that lives in Earth as well, um, which is maybe one that gets a little less attention. Um, so how do people like me go about learning about these deep subsurface microbes that are hopefully underneath everything? Um, well, we go out in nature and we get samples. Um, occasionally people ask me, um, you know, because I do a lot of computational stuff, I write papers, I'm a professor, um, certainly someone goes out and gets dirty and gets this stuff for you. And, <laughs> nope, <laughs> that's why I do this. <laughs> I could have gone into a lot of different fields, but I picked one where I literally go in volcanoes. That's what I want to do. And ships. Um, so we go out and we get the samples. And then we either measure things out in nature or we bring them back into our lab to measure things at home. Um, but we measure a lot of chemicals. So I end up doing a lot of chemistry on these samples. Um, we try to ask really basic questions like, what are they eating and what are they breathing? And how does that, since there's so many of them, any eating and breathing that they do is gonna have a really big effect on the whole earth. Um, and then another really important thing that we do is we extract their DNA. So we do a chemical extraction of literal smelly muck from underneath the ocean and we pull out 
all their DNA or other biomolecules, whatever makes up a cell, directly from a natural sample. And then we could also sometimes bring them home and grow them in our laboratories, or at least we try to. So this is um, the data that I'm going to show you, the project that I'm going to talk about today was obtained using drill ships like this one. This is the Joydis resolution. Um, this is the US drill ship. Um, to put in perspective just how, um, I think if you're not in research, maybe you don't uh, have a good conception of whether how many of these ships there are, for instance. Um, there's one of this ship, and uh, this is it for the United States. That's our, that's our drill ship right there for science. And um, the Japanese have one too. It's called Shikyu, and the Europeans have a more nimble mission-specific platform, um, so they'll retrofit another ship um, here and there around the globe to get to the tight spaces. Um, so it's, we're pretty lucky when we get time on this ship and we get to go get some deep sea samples. And this drill stack up here is a, not a very bright laser pointer. You see the drill stack, right? <laughs> so that's a huge pipe. They, the drillers put together these pipes and send it down on a long string to get deep, 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 like multiple football fields into the mud at the bottom of the sea. Um, so what do we know about the microbes that are present on Earth? Well, even before we discovered the deep subsurface, we knew a lot about microbes on Earth. Um, there are many, many different kinds. I just got this picture off the internet and I love it um, because maybe it seems a little gross <laughs> to start out with. Um, but truly, most of these microbes don't kill us. They're kind of okay. Um, and one thing you can think of to remember that they're not killing us is that you can do this. You can make that kind of a handprint that grows up into all these different microflora, but presumably that person's not dying from disease from all these microbes. Um, but I will point out that humans only evolved relative to when bacteria evolved on this planet, which was we think somewhere at least around 3.8 billion years ago. Um, we only showed up you know, a few million years ago or so. I don't quite know when. Um, so that means that we haven't been around long compared to microbes, so I'm going to put yet on there. <laughs> maybe, maybe they will take us down. They just haven't evolved to do it just yet. So I want to tell you about the first microbes that we found um, in our first drill ship cruise that was dedicated to microbiology, where the microbiologists got to run the cruise and say, we're going to work really hard not to contaminate everything. Um, it's really hard to work in deep ocean drilling because the lubricant for the drill that we use is seawater, and seawater is full of microbes. So we are literally potentially contaminating everything we do. So this cruise was the first time we had a chance to actually put tracers in that and make sure that we were not contaminating the interior of our cores and we could get out some microbes. So I'll show you our results. And the way I will show you our results is not with um, a bunch of um, esoteric stuff. I'm just going to make little boxes for the different microbes that we found. So I'll put up a blue box if we got a strain of a microbe that is similar to something that another microbiologist discovered sometime. And then I'll put a white box up if it's like something totally new, something exotic that's never been discovered before. So that's what we found, all these different boxes. And you can tell that most of them are pretty light. Um, they're not uh, very dark. We found a bunch of really novel stuff. And this is actually, I didn't do this work alone. I did this in a large international group of people. We all sort of found the same things at the same time. But this was my first project as a PhD student when I started out and I just, this just grabbed me. I was like, oh my God, it's like this world full of weird stuff. So if you're a microbiologist, you look at this world full of weird stuff and you say, well, I'm gonna get it to grow in lab. I'm, everything down there is something new, so I'm gonna put it on a Petri dish. So we had um, scientists who were on the cruise who did just that. I wasn't on that team. Um, people far more experienced than I am who really know about getting microbes into culture. And so I'll put up their results. And every time they got a microbe that's the same one that we got, I'll put it underneath the box that we got. And if they got new ones, I'll stack them out to the right, okay? And the colors are gonna be the same. So if it's similar to what has known before, it's dark blue, and if it's something new, it's white. So here's the results. Zero, <laughs> zero overlap. Sorry, that was a setup. <laughs> They didn't find anything that we found. Um, and furthermore, the things that they grew were kind of what had already been found before. And then another group tried it, and they got the same result um, with slightly different results. And I, I do not want to malign these groups. Um, they spent a lot. There, were, there was blood, sweat, and tears that went into these data points. They worked really hard on it. Um, but there's something we're, we're missing. And I, I 
give this talk publicly a fair amount, and often people email me afterwards and say, pressure, it's pressure. Sure, <laughs> pressure is <pressure's> important, um, but it's not the fix-all. Um, people have done this with pressure vessels, and it's, it's not the only answer. It doesn't magically get you the, the good stuff. Um, but because this stuff is so mysterious, um, we've started calling it microbial dark matter. So it's like, <laughs> if you know about astronomical dark matter, it's this incredibly abundant thing in the universe. Um, it's this abundant group. It's a controversial word for microbiologists, but I think it's descriptive. So the presence of this vast quantity of unknown microbes makes us have to take a step back, I think. So this is, I would say, two tenets of Microbiology 101. If you took microbiology in school, you probably learned microbes grow in cultures, and we kind of know what microbes do on this planet. They breathe oxygen, they make oxygen, they do this, they do that. I would just like to point out that this is a frame. <laughs> This may be true, I'm not saying it's not true, but we have to question whether we know what microbes do on this planet, given that such a vast ecosystem is almost entirely undescribed. Um, so we have to be humble in how we ask questions about this and not presume we know things. Um, so when I, when I try to get at, at this question of what they're doing, this vast ecosystem, I try to like get in the microbes perspective, like think about it like these guys that are living in the subsurface. And uh, I gotta tell you, it's not a great place to be. Um, this is my sort of schematic of what I think sea, subsea floor sediments are like. So this is my little cartoon of, at the top in blue is seawater, and then there's um, mud um, as you go down. And the way ocean sediments get layered is just slow raining of detritus, very, very slowly. And things like oxygen, which gets you a ton of energy to breathe, that's why we can keep such big bodies going and we're just exuding heat all the time because we're breathing in oxygen. That gets used up really quickly. It's gone. And they have to go to less good electron receptors like iron, um, manganese, sulfate. And finally, when the sulfate's all breathed up, the last thing they have to breathe is carbon dioxide. And I think that's a crazy thing to think about. They breathe carbon dioxide. Um, but it works. Uh, the chemistry of it works out, and where there is chemistry to be catalyzed, a microbe has probably evolved to catalyze it and get energy from it. Um, so this means that we have decreasing oxidation potential. All those different chemicals that get used up sequentially are crappier and crappier from driving a living system. You combine this with the fact that there's no fresh inputs of food. So the food that they're eating, like how they actually build their biomass from carbon, they have to eat the leftovers of what got laid down sometimes thousands of years ago. So you add those two things together, and it means that you have vastly decreasing energy availability to run life as you get buried in these marine sediments. Um, so we predict from this that the number of microbial cells should also decrease with depth because there's less energy to support them. And one thing we do have, as we have gone around the world and done quite a few of these cruises at this point, is data on how many microbial cells there are. And this is a plot of a conglomeration of a bunch of different research cruises and a bunch of different oceans and areas. And it's true. Um, up here at the top, at the top of this plot is seawater. So this is looking into the sediments. And then on the x-axis here is the log cell concentration. So this is looking at the t multiplication of 10 value for the amount of cells that are there. And no matter where you go, the number of cells does decrease with depth. Um, so this is, this is true. Um, but we want to know, um, just because they're decreasing with depth doesn't mean that they're um, not growing. They could just be um, growing a little bit, and then the total number is decreasing. Um, so we know, just as a, as a benchmark, E. coli has a doubling time of 30 minutes. So like that handprint that I showed you, which are things like E. coli that are fast growing, they probably only grew that up over maybe a couple of nights or a, a week. Um, so doubling time of 30 minutes can get you to a turbid culture overnight. Um, so I'll show you the, the growth rates that we think are happening for these microbes um, with a show you the y-axis first so that you're oriented. Um, so this is looking down into the sediments with the sediment age on the y-axis, um, going down to about 5,000 years old. And up at the surface, we already find a very long generation time. So less, big, more than a tenth of a year, almost up to a year uh, generation time up at the surface. But then as you drop down, um, that creeps up until it almost starts to approach 50 years. 
So this is E. coli doubles in 30 minutes. These organisms are doubling in 50 years. That's weird. <laughs> we don't have a biological concept to really wrap our brains around life that's that slow. Um, so uh, we also can find that there's a cumulative number of generations. Uh, so if you add up, given this estimate for how quickly they, they divide, um, and you can see how, they're, how many generations they've gone through, once you get past that like 2,500 year mark, when they go down below that, you're not actually seeing much cell division at all. So they're not growing much. <laughs> They're just selectively dying. It's sort of like the winners in the deep subsurface are just the ones who die less slowly. And um, this led my first graduate student, who has now graduated and did a fantastic job with his PhD, um, to give me this quote that I just think is gold, so I'm going to share it with you. It's not a biome, Karen. It's a die. Oh, it was dying. So good. So, this brings up the question in this talk that's perhaps a little awkward. Um, if it's just dying, what am I doing? Why are we here? Um, I am doing the short answer to this is that I think it's okay to be dying. I mean, <laughs> we're all to some extent doing that and our lives are worth something. Um, and I think it's fascinating. I think that to, to do this, to achieve this feat of living for so long, um, there's got to be some interesting evolutionary pressure driving such an ecosystem. I, I just I want to know how does that happen? How does this biological oddity even come about? If we're you know we can't break the Darwinian laws of evolution of the, sorry theory of ed evolution. Um, it's an important distinction. Um, so so following our what we know about natural selection, how how does this get to be? What's the point of living so long? Um, so if we think about the rules of ecology. Mostly, the game is to win a race. You got to elbow out your competitors. Um, we have different strategies for doing this. It's not, we, we've known for hundreds of years that ecology is not just about growing fast. There are slow growers too. So there's tortoises out in this world. We call them the K strategists versus the R strategists. The K strategists, they kind of sit and wait and they plod along like a tortoise and sometimes they win in the end. Um, but my point is that that, that doesn't apply to these ecosystems because they're not growing at all. So it's not just a question of waiting to grow, it's just literally not growing. Um, so maybe there's like a different way to think about this, and this is sort of how I think about it. Like um, maybe the goal is not to grow fast, but it's just to exist. And I don't know if y'all get these pop references, but I've got two options. So I can hit you with you. So the left guy is a Zen Buddhist monk, and you know he may look like he's doing nothing, but, but he's doing something. Um, the guy on the right, does anybody want to shout out who that is? Yeah, the big Lebowski, the dude abides. Um, <laughs> he does pretty much nothing in that whole movie. Um, it's philosophy for life. Um, so I'll tell you about some of what we learned about some of these microbes that are just existing, that are not really doing much, um, in the Baltic Sea. Um, so this is the sea. It's a pretty big sea that's in between Finland and Sweden and um, Estonia, Latvia, Russia, and this is one of these um, uh, drilling vessels that's outfitted by the European group um, to be able to fit underneath the bridge in Denmark, basically, is why we had to use that ship. And this is work done um, by, most of the work was done by my student Jordan Bird, who said the diam thing, um, but also was, was helped by a newer PhD student, uh, Joy Bongiorno, who has also moved on. Um, so we wanted to say, what are the potential mechanisms that allow bacteria and archaea, those are two types of microbes, to persist in near zero growth state for 8,000 years, 50 meters into the Baltic Sea sediments? Just what can we, like really open into question, how can we figure that out? Um, so we use this method, um, so one, one of the things that we need to be able to do is we need to be able to get their DNA out and know what their cells are doing so we can recreate their potential lives. Um, so if you, I'm just, I'm going to describe to you the technique that we use to get these things out. So if you think of all the sediments in a natural, or, sorry, all the microbes in a natural sediment, it's a mixed population. Every different color is sort of my example of a different microbe. And what we do is we physically remove one cell from that big mixture. Um, we do this with this really cool thing called flow cytometry, which I'm not going to go into, but it involves lasers. 
in small droplets of water. And so we get one cell by itself, and then we crack it open, chemically usually, and then we get its genome um, by making lots and lots of amplifications of its genome. And then we can get enough DNA so that we can actually um, achingly cut it up into little pieces, sequence it, that means putting it into a black box proprietary machine, which spits back out a bunch of data. And then on computers, we put the data back together and assemble a genome. And that's how we figure out um, what genome they have. So then we've got a genome and we can analyze the genes that are present. And you can imagine genes, I know you've all heard of genes, but um, in this context, what we're using them for is like a menu order for what the organism can do. Like, oh, it's got a gene to breathe oxygen. Yeah, okay, it can probably breathe oxygen, that kind of thing. Um, so one of the, I'm not gonna go through systematically every gene that we found, um, although it would be fascinating, but you would all fall asleep. Um, I will just pick out a couple that were kind of cool. Um, one that recurred quite a bit was for something called a toxin-antitoxin system. So I don't know if y'all know that life does this, but this is actually common, but um, there are microbes that will continuously express a toxin that will kill themselves, themselves, and they just do this. And the only reason why they don't die from it is that they simultaneously express an antidote for it. <laughs> so they're just like making toxin, pulling it away making toxin, pulling it away. And this is well studied in particular for methana, uh, sorry, for um, uh, mycoplasma tuberculosis, which is the um, organism, the bacteria that calls, causes tuberculosis. And so this is just a plot showing the different amounts of toxin antitoxin systems in different strains. And that big blue bar shows you that there's almost 50 copies of this toxin antitoxin system in tuberculosis. This is interesting for us, because the reason why tuberculosis is such a deadly disease is that it sits in wait. So tuberculosis is like the deep sea sediment microbe of the pathogenic world. It just does nothing. And by doing nothing, it can form a granuloma in your lung and kill you later. Um, so that is one of the ways that, it, that people think that it does this, is that it basically uses this toxin any toxin system to regulate its cell growth and really crank down its activity. Um, so when we saw that, we we're like, oh, Interesting, maybe we've got some of that stuff. So we went through all our genomes and looked for toxin antitoxin systems and found them in huge abundance. So this is uh, just a list on the, y, on the bottom x-axis here, are just the different names of organisms. These are all um, these strange uncultured microbes that we found in this place. And on the y-axis, I've got the number of pin domains for toxin antitoxin um, systems that we found. And some of them were approaching tuberculosis level of, anti of toxin antitoxin systems. Um, so I just want to make sure I know what's coming up next. Um, all right, so that's, that's a mechanism that we think um, they're managing to, uh, to grow or to, to stop from growing in the system. Um, but we have to solve this problem of what they're doing, like how they're eating. So everyone's starving because the food is 8,000 years old, um, but that's okay because they clearly have these toxin antitoxin systems and maybe some other things. So they're not growing fast. So it's okay to not have too much food, um, but they do have to eat. Um, you can't get by without some kind of metabolism. So what are they actually doing? Um, luckily, I have uh, very good collaborators at the University of Tennessee, Drew Steen and his student, Jenna Schmidt. And what they did was they designed custom enzyme assays to look at how quickly different types of food are taken up, maybe by enzymes, um, but they could do this proxy. And so what they found is this, again, these plots are shown with, on the y-axis, this is all into the sediment. So up at the top would be like the water. And they found that they could see activity for some of these fairly normal um, sugar degrading enzymes. And they were higher at the surface and they were going, decreasing a bit with depth. Um, but it does seem that they are eating things like sugars, so sort of normal stuff to be eating. Um, so what we wanted to do was to figure out whether we could figure out which one of these strange, weird microbes were eating these, who is responsible for eating this food? We could see the food being eaten. So what we did was we looked for these enzymes in the genomes, and then we looked to see whether those genes were turned on and getting expressed. And we found that if we plot the amount of expression in these different groups of bacteria, the um, uncultured, strange aminosinantes, atrobacteria, and, and actinobacteria, OPB41. I know those words don't mean anything to you. Um, it's actually fine. They don't mean anything to us either. Um, they're not, nobody's cultured these. Um, 
maybe somebody's working on the middle one, but we have to give them these sort of placeholder names until we know more about them. Um, but they're real. Um, but you can see that like for the beta glucosidase, there's these red triangles that are pretty high at the top, at the top and then they decrease with depth. And so this red triangle guy, this atrobacteria guy, seems to be the most active one. So this is the one that seems to be getting at the food sources, um, which we thought was pretty interesting. You know, who, what, what's making this guy do so well? Um, but the deal is with these sorts of assays, we have to guess at what the substrate is. You know, we put in a substrate and we say, how quickly is it broken down? Um, can we take a step back and say like, this is such an unknown ecosystem, we don't know what they're eating. Let's just, I don't know, ask. What are they, that's a harder question to do without any presumption of what they might be eating. So we wanted to, how do we discover new food sources rather than just running assays for the food we're guessing that they're eating? Um, and the way we decided to do this was with metabolomics. And that is another big word, but it is basically a collection of all these small molecules that are present in a system. So usually when you get the data, it looks like this. Um, here's a picture of the uh, lab group. So Sean Campania's lab group did this work. Um, it looks like a subway map of all the different cellular functions that can be going on in a cell. And it, it works beautifully in a pure culture where you have um, certain things dialed up and other things dialed down, and they're sort of going back and forth. And uh, I, I thought it was crazy to put in mud from beneath the bottom of the Baltic Sea into this high-powered um, LCMSMS that Sean Campania's group uses to do this work. But Hector, um, who's a good friend of mine and, and works in that lab, would always say, wouldn't it be so cool just to see what kind of metabolites were in your sediments? And I was like, but it's going to be a big mess. We're not going to figure anything out. And he's like, let's just try it. So I'm like, OK, well, let's try it. And so he, he ran the samples. You know, it took us a while to prepare them. And he ran them. And I was like, all right, what's the result? Did you get anything? And he's like, it's complete crap. You know, they normally get this subway map. They get like thousands and thousands of, of things back. He's like, oh, it failed. And I was like, yeah, whatever. You know, everything always fails in marine sediments. I'm not surprised. Did you get anything? And he's like, we only got 20. It's like, 20? That is so much more than zero. Like, 20 <laughs> is wonderful. So we took off running with our 20 metabolites. And one of them, I'm just going to tell you about one, ended up being this strange molecule called allantoin. I'd never heard of until it came up in this assay. And this is a heat map. So heat maps are where the saturation of the box, so this is similar to the DNA type of um, data that I was showing you, tells you how much of it there is. And here's the different depths in two different cores. And allantoin was present at fairly high abundance in almost every depth. So this is something that was persistent in almost all of these samples. Um, we're not quite sure what the allantoin's coming from. Um, we could be a decay product of DNA from things that die. That's possible. Um, but it stuck out to us because it is a nutritious food source in a place that is a desert for food. So we thought, there's probably somebody there who's eating it. And remember that the one who was eating all the sugars was called atrobacteria. And here again, we found, now I'm showing the different types of bacteria along the uh, kind of x-axis there. That first column is the atrobacteria. And this is the amount of the enzymes that they had. And the circled enzyme, number one there, is the key enzyme for the breakdown of allantoin. And atrobacteria were the only group that were exp expressing that one enzyme. So yet again, <laughs> it looked like they were eating all the sugar and also eating all the allantoin. So it looks like they were the only ones who could eat this really nutritious food source. So if atrobacteria are the best at eating all the food, why don't they just kill everybody and just win? I mean, that's, I feel like this is like um, uh, Darwinian evolution, or at least a simplistic understanding of Darwinian evolution 101 is, um, you know, uh, if you're the best at eating everything, then just, you know, take over, take over the whole system. Um, so we looked into its genome to see what else was there. Um, we did make a bit of a subway map, this is based on, on genes. And we found that, um, that we could describe lots of different cellular functions in this organism. So it looked to be not just was it good at taking up these different food sources, it 
did a lot of things. Um, we could identify um, respiration molecules, um, fermentation molecules. It seemed to be doing a lot of stuff. And um, I, obviously, I don't expect you to read every pathway, metabolic pathway we found in this organism. But uh, the evidence for a lot of these metabolic pathways was really helped by the fact that we had red boxes around all these different chemicals from our metabolite stuff. So we were able to work in the metabolites that they did find into this organism. Um, but one thing that we found a, quite a bit of is that they appeared to be making a lot of amino acids. So um, all this, this sort of central dotted box is all biosynthetic pathways for making amino acids. And amino acids are what make up proteins. So the bulk of the biomass of a cell is made out of amino acids. So these guys were winning at that too. They're just making the most um, cellular biomass. Um, Okay, so this is all pieces of a story that is going somewhere, I promise. Um, we wanted to, again, take a step back, and this is work that I did with more collaborators. I have amazing collaborators all over the world. Um, this is with Brandy Reese at Texas A&M and Laura Zinke, who was at University of Southern California when we did this work. Um, we wanted to say, okay, we have all these potential functions that Atcher bacteria are doing. What's the most heavily in use by this organism? What does it, what's it really geared up to do? And for that, we did metatranscriptomics, which is just a way to get the RNA out of the cell. So this is as genes are turned on and become functional and will transcribe into proteins, we make messenger RNA for them. And so if you have messenger RNA floating around inside a cell, it's often a good indicator, not always, but can be a good indicator that that is a gene that is turned on and it's functioning and is cranking out proteins. So they were able to get a complete assessment of all the mRNA so that we could say what enzymes are being cranked out the fastest. And what they found is that the second most highly expressed protein in this whole organism was an exporter. <laughs> this thing down at the bottom that I drew a circle around, um, it's an exporter for amino acids. So let's think about this. <laughs> this is the best one. This is the guy who could take over. It's making a lot of food for other things. Good amino acids are something that everyone can use. And instead of building up a bunch of biomass and winning, it's spitting it out. Just like for everybody else. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, we, we could have the wrong interpretation of this. We're inferring a lot from this. But that seemed really strange to us, that in such an energy-limited situation, this organism would just give away its best stuff, just spit it right on out of the cell. Um, I mean, we could be wrong. It, it may not, you know, that the function of that protein may not be that. But it was the second most highly expressed protein in this cell, and that's what it appeared to be. So um, I don't know if you guys are into apocalyptic movies at all. Um, I am not. I don't like scary movies, but I did watch one of them, and it was called Zombieland. <laughs> and I learned from Woody Harrelson that the thing to do when there's scarce resources is to get a lot of guns and to hoard your food and to say, everybody else go away. And these guys seem to be doing the opposite of that. They're not at all. Not only are they not killing everybody else, they're giving away food. Um, so all we could think of is that um, the reason that they're doing this is that if they build up too much amino acids inside their cell, they probably will have to divide. So the cell division rate of cells is often correlated with the concentration of intracellular amino acids of the cell. So if they let this, they're the winners, but if they build up their good stuff too much, they'll actually make a daughter cell, and that's not good. <laughs> they don't want to divide because that's competition, um, there's not much energy around, so they need to find a way to keep their metabolism going without getting too, too crazy and actually making a new cell too often. So that's our theory. It might not be right, <laughs> um, but that's what we can think of right now, is that they give that stuff away simply because if they build up too many resources, they'll make too many cells. They'll be running too hot. They have it like a, a thermostat, a regulator on them. But this has the lovely effect, potentially, of feeding everybody else in the environment. Um, and I, I don't presume altruism in microbes. They're not doing this because they like everybody. Um, I think that it is advantageous for them to spit it out for this thermostat reason. But maybe this is part of the reason why we see so many organisms in this terrible, awful place to live, is because they can eat the leftovers of this guy who's sort of forming a keystone species in this ecosystem. 
or we're wrong. <laughs> um, so sort of I want to I want to end with a sort of a, a different thought that derives from this, which is this weird ecosystem where somehow the point is not to grow too much. You have to grow to have evolution work. You have to have natural selection. You have to genes that were that helped you to be successful give you a higher chance of passing, you know, more of your progenies survive because you had better genes. That's sort of how evolution works. Um, but, but if you're being buried in marine sediment, hundreds of meters of down to nothingness, what, what selects for that? Why in the world would there be genes that are selected for it to just sit in stasis for possibly millions of years? Um, and, uh, Yeah, so, so I, I had a different way I was going to go with this, but so, how, oh yeah, right. What I wanted to say was I, I know that there is one possibility that um, they do this for no reason. You know, I've, I've had this said to me by, by folks that, well, it's just by accident. You know, they just, they just didn't manage to die. They're there, and that's on the table. That could be. It could be that this is not selected for. However, the fact that we see so many what I presume to be genetic adaptations to be successful, to have these toxin and antitoxin systems, to be slow, these are adaptations to that place. So somehow they had to have a selective advantage in their ancestry that kept those genes in place and had them there. Um, so the question is, how do you get back up to the surface so that you can grow again back to where the food is good and you, can, you actually want to go through cell division if you're buried, buried deep, deep, deep in um, marine sediments? And to think about this, we have to remember that they're very slow, long-lived organisms. And so in our minds, if you're buried in marine sediment, you're never going to come back up on our time scales. But remember plate tectonics. <laughs> if you're on an oceanic plate, you're not going to be there forever. You're going to very slowly crash into a continent and you're going to go down. You're going to go down into the mantle. And so this is what happens at the edges of our oceans. We have subducting slabs of oceanic sediments and crust and subducting lithosphere. And this all gets dragged down underneath um, a continental crust. And then eventually volcanoes form and this whole system um, happens. But actually, um, as this oceanic plate is slowly being crushed underneath um, a continental plate, there's plenty of opportunities for things to come back up. Um, of course, by the time it hits mantle, the microbes are not going to survive. That's not going to happen. Um, at least life as we know it is not going to survive that way. It's too hot. They're just all going to melt. But well before you get to the volcanic um, genesis zone, you have lots of places where marine sediment actually gets kicked back up to the surface. So it is possible that one of the evolutionary drivers on this deep subsurface life is that it's just waiting to hit a continent and get pushed back up to the surface. And the, whoever had the best genes for not dying in that system got the best leg up when they finally got pushed up and could divide again. And that's how the genes got passed along and selected for. Um, it's going to be a tough hypothesis to prove. <laughs> but it's one that has entranced me, and I can't get rid of it. Um, so that's why I go to volcanoes now. <laughs> so I'm trying to look for things coming back on the other end of it. And just even, even if I'm not looking at um, these microbial cells actually getting resurrected per se, um, we still, I think we have so many novel uh, discoveries that we can make just by taking off the limitation that biology has to be fast, like live fast and die young. Um, what if these things have a much longer time span to work with? Then suddenly geology becomes relevant for these guys. And um, it's cool. Uh, I think it's a fun, fun thing to do. Um, so with that, I will thank my funding people. Um, it is uh, a beautiful thing about our society that people appreciate um, thinking strange thoughts about deep subsurface microbes. And um, I thank everyone for that. That's my university, the University of Tennessee. It's quite lovely. It's on the Tennessee River. And thank you all for listening. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> that was wonderful. I'd never really thought of life having the 50, 100 million year strategy to get back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, we've got time for questions. Who's got questions for Dr. Lloyd? I'm scared of walking past this thing. All right, we're good now. Yeah. So I see NASA as one of your funders. Yeah. So what does this say for something on some moon? Yeah, the moon circling Saturn are great. 
The one circling Jupiter, also good. Um, yeah, I think that if you look for life extraterrestrially, it makes a lot of sense to look underneath because simply we're the only object in our solar system that has an atmosphere that's this thick. So since almost no other planetary body has this nice protective cocoon around it, your cocoon's gonna be inside. And so subsurface life is absolutely possible within the solar system. But I mean, that's an easy thing to say. Just because we've explored so little, it's simple for me to say that, but. Is that NASA's interest? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so my, my NASA funding for this is through the exobiology program. And so we did this by looking at very low energy life um, because that's an area of, of active research is just figuring out how little life energy, uh, how little life, how little energy life can get by on. It's important for understanding what parts of our world, our universe, are habitable. And this. So one of the strategies that um, is being considered for dealing with global warming is taking a lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere and putting it deep into its formation. Yeah. 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 I can't. Did you guys hear the question? I should probably be repeating these questions. He was asking, with carbon capture and sequestration as a possible strategy for mitigating climate change, what impact does that have on these ecosystems? Um, we we really don't know enough about that right now. Um, I, it is something that I am definitely turning my eye to for sure. Um, I think that I I think that kind of the technological advances that are the focus right now is more on the capture part of it um, because there's so much work to be done in making that like it can be done but making it efficient making it cost effective all those things need to happen and i think there's sort of a thinking that the storage part is a little bit more of a constrained problem it's kind of more solved but in my mind i want to know a, how that affects the ecosystems down there, and B, what those ecosystems are going to do to that carbon. <laughs> are they going to like hang on to it, or are they going to mess us up somehow? And it may all be fine, but I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in there. Yes. I think a fairly quick question. One is the doubling time is very, very long, but do they actually reproduce? We don't know. And See, quick question, quick answer. Yeah. Yeah, well, so the, that's, do you guys hear those ones? Yeah. Do you repeat them in a minute? Okay, I'll repeat every single one. The first one was, um, do they actually double? Um, I have a lot of discussions with people about this. We, the answer is we don't know, um, but I think you can make the argument that they would have to, but I don't, I think it's a fascinating question, maybe about entropy, that like, how could you, like theoretically, a cell could just replace individual molecules forever but that doesn't seem to happen. So what is the thing that makes you have to divide to like make a whole new cell as opposed to just, you know, replacing broken parts? The second question I have forgotten. It was, have you found things oh yeah, did we find did evidence that things, your, right, did we? <laughs> um, so we don't, no, no, we have not. Um, it's partly because we haven't really, tested that hypothesis per se. I mean, we go to places where things come back up a fair amount and we see similar organisms. So we can at least, the, the, the low level test of, we could, we could throw out the hypothesis if there were no similarities between what's coming back up and what's going down. Then we'd be like, okay, definitely not. Um, but there's at least enough similarities that I think we can continue to test that hypothesis. But it might be actually a very narrow range where the exhumation happens because it doesn't take very far into a subduction zone before you hit killing levels of, of temperatures. So the question, as I understand it, is if we have a similar geochemical or an environmental regime in, in water, uh, well, marine sediments, and then also on land, will we expect to find the same microbes? Um, we do not find the same microbes, by and large, in this subsurface of land and the subsurface of uh, marine sediments, but that could just be because we, I don't know how to find an identical chemical regime, just because things are 
inherently different when they've been um, detritally brought down from seawater. Um, theoretically, yeah. Yeah, how bad would that be if all the micro friends died with the carbon storage? Um, and then your career, but... My career? <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> I would be happy to be a casualty if it stopped climate change. I'm <laughs> totally serious about that. Um, uh, I don't think... Uh, I, I actually don't view this as a preserve the microbes in the subsurface game, um, just because they are such a bigger ecosystem than we normally think about. I don't know. You could kill them off in one. I don't want to go too far. I don't want to say, like, oh, do anything you want. They're fine. Um, but I think that um, microbial populations are pretty resilient, um, much more so than um, we have a bigger problem right now with um, deep sea mining. Um, that's starting up. And that's actually bulldozing a lot of really gorgeous ecosystems that are, um, have animals in them, which are a little more fragile. Those I'm very concerned about. But I, yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. I don't really know the answer right now, what, how bad it would be. Yeah? I don't know if this is a right question, but did you do any carbon dating to find out how far back this microbe started? And what substrates did they have to start and form and then come? So the question is, did we do carbon dating to see how far back these microbes go? Um, we sometimes look at C14 concentrations. We're actually in, you identified the correct time span. We can use radiocarbon dating on these, on these time scales. Um, we didn't in that particular study simply because we have age dating from, I believe, lead to 10 decay. You can use other isotopes for this. Um, so we know at what depth. Like we know how old the different depth layers are, just from that that reason for that reason, but um, I don't know if that would tell us what food they eat. Oh, in the back. Yeah, that's a great question. Given that we haven't cultured these things, how do we figure out their cell turnover times? Those are calculations, and they're estimates, made in bulk. So one nice thing about marine sediments being nicely layered systems, you can, that takes away a lot of the complexity. And so you can actually model the rate of disappearance of various respiratory substrates. And of course, we use differential models that take into account other things like porosity changes and compaction um, and diffusion and advection. So those are sort of the things you have to nail down. Once you've nailed all those things down, the last thing is microbial respiration. So you get that term out of your equation, and then you apply that, and you know how much energy is available for all this respiration, and then you d pass it out all over the cells, and you see how much energy is available, and then you have to make assumptions about how much energy it would take to turn over that population. Um, so there's assumptions in that. So your second question. Oxygen being a doublet. A doublet sword. Double -edged sword. That as you go deeper and deeper, you don't have access to oxygen, but you also don't have oxidative stress. That's right. So in these organisms that you have sequenced, do you find an absence of those enzymes? I mean, yeah. Uh, is there an absence of detoxifying enzymes? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so losing oxygen, he's pointing out, can be a good thing and a bad thing. So I'm saying it's a bad thing because they can't breathe it, but he points out that you don't have oxidative stress, which is actually something that our bodies are trying to mitigate right now. We're constantly fighting against um, oxidative stress. And there are enzymes, known enzymes, that um, help organisms to battle this. And we do not see catalase, peroxidase, or superoxide dismutase, which are like the three big ones up in the surface world. Um, but we kind of, that's kind of a little bit low-hanging fruit. Like, that was like, okay, well, that would be really weird to have those big expensive enzymes with literally no oxygen around. We do see some oxidative stress enzymes, though. We see um, rubrithrosin, which, um, and erythro, I forgot the name of it. Um, there are some sort of lower redox. Um, so I think they do experience some oxidative stress that they have to deal with. But, but that's a good point, that it's actually not so bad to be buried, because at least you don't have the toxicity of oxygen. talking about the, these uh, cells were uh, excreting or exporting? We think. Uh, yeah. 
Yes. <coughs> Did know why, or you weren't sure why. Is there <coughs> any thought of symbiosis? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's right. So um, he was asking, we see, we infer that they seem to be spitting out um, amino acids from their cells. Could it be to support a symbiosis? Um, absolutely. Um, the only thing is that we, when we look at cells under the microscope, they don't seem to be close together in groups as much. Um, so we don't, there's no automatic reason why we would infer a lot of symbioses. But it, there are all kinds of good energetic reasons to form symbioses, and that is definitely a possibility for sure. I would like to... Um, have everybody thank Dr. Lloyd again, and please continue.